the paper titled A Hybrid Dual Domain Cascade of Convolutional Neural Networks for Magnetic Resonance Image Reconstruction, and it's presented by Roberto Souza. Good morning. My name is Roberto Souza. I'm a postdoc at the University of Calgary. The title of my work is A Hybrid Cascade of Convolutional Neural Networks for MRI Reconstruction. I have nothing to disclose other than I'm a little bit afraid to speak in public, but just that. <laughs> So MR data is acquired in K-space, also known as the frequency domain or the Fourier domain. So if we sample the K-space data following the Nyquist theorem, usually if we apply the inverse Fourier transform, we get an image that is, has a good quality. So in this case, acquisition is slow, reconstruction is fast, usually image is good, but unfortunately time is money, acquisition is very slow, if you are from a country like in Brazil, we have huge wait lines to get a MR exam, so we wish that we could do things faster. So if you under sample case space and you just apply the inverse Fourier transform, this is called the zero field reconstruction. So in this case, acquisition is going to be fast because you collected fewer samples. Reconstruction will also be fast because you use the inverse fast Fourier transform, which is fast, but usually image is bad. So traditional compressed sensing techniques, they try to leverage image sparsity to undersample case space. These techniques they are usually nonlinear, and they are also iterative. So they are usually kind of slow to reconstruct an image. So this scenario, acquisition is fast, reconstruction is slow, but the image quality is good. Deep learning reconstruction is a really hot topic right now. I would say in the past couple of years, we had about 40 publications just on MR reconstruction. Many consider that machine learning is a new frontier on image reconstruction. And the expectation is that deep learning is capable of reconstructing the image by using a properly trained network in a single pass. So there is no iteration there. You, if you use an optimized GPU code, the expectation is acquisition will be fast, reconstruction will be fast, image will be good. Usually many papers say that it's even better than traditional compressed sensing reconstruction. So deep learning reconstruction can be classified into four different groups. So we have image domain learning, case-based learning, domain transform learning, and also a hybrid case-based and image domains learning. The image learning, you start with your under sample case space, you take the inverse first fast Fourier transform, you have a, the zero field reconstructed image, and you just process using a properly trained network. Most of the works in the literature are image domain learning techniques. Case-based learning, the goal here is to estimate the missing samples in case space, so you train a network, the input is the under sample case space, the output should be the fully sampled case space, then you just apply the inverse fast Fourier transform and you get a good image. Most works that do case-based learning, they are more focused on parallel imaging and not compressed sensing, but this is another way to speed up the acquisition of MR exams. We also have a group called domain transform learning. So in this case here, you try to learn how to transform the maps, the undersampled case space to a high quality image. The most notable paper is this one from last year, published in Nature. The only problem is that this transform that we try to learn is, is, has a quadratic complexity. So for, a, let's say, an image that is 256 by 256, your model would have maybe one billion parameters that you need to learn, so the hardware is not really there for you to do this. And we had a few papers last year, Mikai, also this year, the ISMRM, they are trying to reduce this parameter complexity, but I didn't have time to compare in this work. And hybrid case space and image domain learning, basically, you're going to act both in case space domain, usually you have a network in case space domain, you take the inverse fast Fourier transform, you don't learn the transform here, and then you have a deep learning model in image domain. There has been a few works that also tried to reconstruct MR images using this approach. So the goal of my presentation is to propose a hybrid dual domain cascade of convolutional neural networks for MRI reconstruction and compare my model with the state of the art. 
Some hypotheses is that hybrid learning approaches are advantageous for MR reconstruction, and also that starting the cascade with an image domain subnetwork is advantageous. So the proposed technique. So this is the architecture that I'm proposing. So I start with the zero field reconstruction, then I have an image domain convolutional neural network, then I take the Fourier transform, and I do data consistency. So basically, data consistency consists in replacing the network case space estimates by the measurements obtained in the sampling process. So basically, you replace what the network estimated by the real values that you acquired during acquisition. Usually, case space is severely undersampled in the high frequencies, and so that's the reason I chose to start with an image domain network, because if you do the zero field reconstruction, you'll get an image that is complete. But if you're working in case space, the high frequencies will be, will have regions with no signal. So if you do a convolution in a region that you have no signal, you have no output. Also, I would like to say that complex numbers are implemented as separate real and imaginary channels. So single channel reconstruction, the input is a case space acquired acquire using a single channel coil. You have your network, you get an image reconstruction. For multi-channel reconstruction, what I'm doing is the input is the channels of the coil, the case space channels. I have a network that tries to learn the corresponding image reconstructions, and then I just combine these images using the square root sum of squares algorithm. So the single channel subnetwork, this is the architecture, it's pretty simple. So I have five convolutional layers, 48 filters in the first four layers. In the last layer, I just go back to the number of channels of my input. And this is for the single channel. For the multi-channel, I just included a few more filters in each layer. And since I'm working with a 12 channel data, I go back to 24 at the end. So remember, we have real and imaginary times 12, so 24 channels. So the experimental setup for my here is for the single channel reconstruction, I have 45 3D T1 weighted scans collected in Calgary. So the coil channels were combined using vendor supply tools. In my case, I use Orchestra from GE Healthcare. Then I applied the inverse Fourier transform in one of the dimensions. So now instead of having a three-dimensional problem, I have a two-dimensional problem. So I use 25 volumes for training, 10 volumes for validation, and 10 volumes for testing. I try two different acceleration factors, so an acceleration of four, an acceleration of five, and I compare against DayGAN, RefineGAN, WNET, KikiNet-like, and Deep Cascade. So these techniques have publicly available code, except for KikiNet-like that I implemented myself. And for the multi-channel reconstruction, I have 60 3D T1 weighted scans. It's a, I use a 12-channel coil. I apply the inverse Fourier transform on the readout direction. So now, again, I have a 2D problem. I use 40 volumes for training, 10 volumes for validation, and 10 volumes for testing. I try two different speed-up factors, 3.5 and 4.5, and I use a Poisson disk sampling scheme in this case. And I only compare against KikiNet-like and Deep Cascade. The metrics that I use in this work are structural similarity, normalized root mean square error, and peak signal to noise ratio. They are commonly used metrics to evaluate image reconstruction. And the results in the discussion. So here are the results for the single channel experiment. So in both cases, hybrid cascade got the best results in all three metrics. For the structural similarity, it was pretty much a tie for the speed up factor of five. The differences were small, but statistically significant for normalized root mean square error and peak SNR. This is a sample reconstruction, so it's a GIF, so we can see the entire volume. On the top, we have the reconstructions using the different networks. On the right side, we have the fully sampled reconstruction. And on the bottom row, we have the residual figures. So I enhanced the residual figures by a factor of eight, so we can see the differences. And here, except for Dagan, you can see that all networks did a pretty good job. You almost don't see any residual in these figures. But if, if we zoom in in specific regions of the brain, like the cerebellum, we can start to see some differences. So I would say that the fully sampled reconstruction, I would say that hybrid cascade, deep cascade, and kicking at like 
are very similar to the fully sampled reconstruction. If we look at WNET, it kind of smooths a little bit the boundaries of the reconstruction. Refined GAN and Day GAN, they also did not did a very good job. Here is a sample reconstruction for a speed up factor of five. So we have the reconstructions and a zoom in in the cerebellum region. We can try to see the differences there. Again, hybrid cascade, deep cascade, and kicking at like are very similar to the reference. And these are the results for the multi-channel experiment. Again, hybrid cascade was better than the compared techniques. The differences were also small, but statistically significant for, for normalized root mean square error and peak SNR. Here is a sample reconstruction. We can see that they are pretty similar to the fully sampled reference. And in summary, this is the ranking of the six techniques that I compared. So the proposed technique, hybrid cascade, was the best one in this comparison. So it's a hybrid learning method. It's flat and rolled, and we use data consistency. So if you look at the top three techniques, they use a flat and rolled structure. They all have data consistency steps. The top four techniques, three out of the top four techniques are hybrid learning techniques. And if you look at the bottom, the, the worst three techniques, WNET, DayGun, and RefineGun, they use a UNET. I don't think I, the UNET is a bad model. I just think that they should have used data consistency. So in my opinion, data consistency makes a big difference. And also the adversarial models didn't work so well in this experiment. So I want to talk about the influence of the domain of the first sub-network. So basically what I said, I think that using an image domain sub-network at the beginning is better than using a case space domain. So in this example here, we have the undersampled case space, the corresponding zero field reconstruction. So the error here is about 15%. In kicking at like that we start with a case space domain network, you can see here that where you have a lot of samples, which is the low frequencies, it does a good job, but it doesn't do a very good job for the high frequencies because you have no signal to do any convolution on. So here the normalized error was 4% for this reconstruction of the first block of the cascade. And for the hybrid cascade that I started with an image domain network, you can see that the reconstructed case space is a lot closer to the reference fully sampled case space, and the error was also smaller, 2.5%. So in summary, hybrid cascade outperform all other techniques in the comparison. The top three techniques are cas ca cascaded networks interleaved with data consistency blocks. So they gun, refine gun, and WNET use UNETs, but they don't have data consistency. I think they suffered from, no, from not having data consistency in their models. And also, starting the cascade with an image domain subnetwork seems to be advantageous for the reconstruction process. I would like to say that the data set using these experiments we made publicly available as part of the Calgary Campinas public brain MR data set. This is the website, so you can download both single channel data and multi channel data if you are interested in MR reconstruction. And that's all. I would just like to acknowledge my lab members and my supervisor, Dr. Richard Frank. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We actually have a lot of time for questions. Any questions from the audience? All right, thanks for a great talk. Did you submit to the fast MRI challenge? Not yet. My problem is it's about one terabyte of data, so I'm struggling with training my network with, with so much data. But yes, I, my intention is to submit to the fast MRI challenge for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks. Can I? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I am uh, by no means expert on case space, but I was confused by your argument about that there is no um, high frequency components in the case space, and then you say, so I better do it in image space, but if there is no high frequency component, then there is no high frequency component. Oh, it's not about having high frequency component. I would say it's about having an image that is zero field, and if you take the inverse full head transform of a zero field case space, you still get an image that is complete, so you, it's not like you have any gaps in the image. So if you, you apply a convolutional kernel, you have signal to do the, 
the operations. While if you are in another sampled case space where you have almost no high frequency information, so it's just zeros, if you put a, let's say, a three by three convolutional kernel there, it's gonna be zero. While if you're in image domain, you're gonna, it's, you don't have the high frequency, but you have the, the image will be complete. You have, it's not zero field, so. Hello, thank you for the talk. Just a clarification. In your iterations, when you, you work on the case space and then in the image domain, um, the blocks look the same, but do they have the same weights at every time, or do you train different weights for different iterations? Well, different weights for different subnetworks. The model is trained end to end, but each subnetwork has a different set of weights. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question on the uh, uh, sign of square uh, reconstruction. So when you ch convert, uh, when you work on the image domain, so do you have any reason using the sign of square instead of the uh, complex, uh, complex channel combined? Because when you do sign of square, you lose the face information. Yes, you're right. We lose the face information, but I guess there is a paper from a I think 20 years ago that shows that combining multi-channel reconstructions use, using the square root sum of squares is optimal in terms of SNR. So basically they have that paper that shows that mathematically, so I just use square root sum of squares. But yeah, I lose phase information. So if it was an image that was interested in the phase information, probably I should have done that a different way. Hi. Um, so it has become aware now that the, uh, the deep learning image reconstruction has a problem with the fact that it can change image content in a, in a, in a way that it could affect diagnosis. Um, how can you prevent that from happening and how do you, let's say, take uh, measures to have your algorithm not do that? Can you, can you comment on that? Uh, so I would say the best way to do this right now is to have a really good test set. So if you really validate on a lot of data, it, that, kind of, that kind of makes you confident to say that it's not gonna change the content. But you also have some techniques that are trained just in the signal that you acquire, so they are not trained on a data set. Like there's a technique called RACI, which is trained on the auto-calibration signal and you try to compute the missing case space samples. In this case, since you're not, your, your network is just trained on the data set you just acquired, you don't have the problem of, let's say, hallucinating new information that the network learned from the training set. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Excellent talk. Um, can you say a word about computational complexity and the speed of your algorithm as it compares to the others? So I have. So they are pretty much the same speed for testing. I would say the refined gun model takes 72 hours to train using this data set while the other models took about eight hours, but reconstruction times using a, an old GPU at GTX 1070 was about 65 milliseconds per slice, so I would say it's pretty fast. Any more questions from the audience? One more? Thank you very much for the, for the, for the nice talk. Um, you have this funny sampling pattern where like uh, different points in case space are on and off. Uh, how practical is that to put on the scanner? So, so the question was about using a fixed sampling pattern? No, 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 like how practical it is to put these sampling patterns uh, on the scanner. It, it depends a little bit on the sequence. So for instance, if you're using a Poisson sampling pattern, Poisson takes a lot of time to create a mask, so you have to pre-compute the mask and save on the scanner, but we're, I'm actually working with someone from GIA to try to implement these sampling patterns and test on, in this case was retrospective undersampling, but we want to do prospective undersampling and see how it works, because when you undersample case space prospectively, the way you walk through case space is different, and you may have eddy current, so the noise pattern will be different from the one that I train using retrospective undersampling, and it, things may not work so well. Okay. Well, I also have a, have a question. 
So if I understood correctly from your presentation, you have 3D case space data and 3D image data, but you apply the inverse Fourier transform along one axis, so you turn it into a 2D problem. Yes. Is there a specific reason for this, or is it just computational burden? It's mostly computational, yes. Uh, and also because in the readout direction, you don't, you cannot undersample in the readout direction. You can, but it doesn't make sense. So you can just take the inverse Fourier transform in the readout direction. You don't lose any information. So you don't lose information, and the problem becomes much more manageable. So I think it's the best way to go. There are no further questions from the audience. I'd like to thank the speaker again for his presentation. Thank you.